Mic check, one, two. You guys can hear me? I never use a mic. This thing is cramping me. I got to wear it on both ears. I got glasses on the front, mic on the back. But we'll work it out. Uh, it's a tremendous joy to be here at the second annual Wrath and Grace Conference. And uh, I'll be honest, man, Pastor Clint got me, he got me kind of hyped preaching that sermon, man. Uh, we got different kind of dudes and people here. Um, you know, we got, we got some missional cats in here. We got some reform cats in here. I see some guys wearing J's. Some guys just went with the flip-flops. You know, I'm wearing Clark Wallabies, okay? Uh, some, some of you guys like LeBron. And then, and then some of you older, grown folks like Michael Jordan. So it's all good. Uh, anyway, we are unified in Christ. And uh, thanks, Pastor Clint, for that rowdy word. Uh, I've been tasked to preach uh, in regards to Christ is greater than sexuality as we engage the culture here. And so I'm not really going to hold you that long. We're going to dive into the text right away and get to it. So, of course, I'm preaching from Ephesians chapter 5. If you guys could kindly join me there. So we're really just going to make a, a few simple observations uh, from Ephesians chapter 5 in verses 31 and 32. But I'm going to do a little bit of reading here to give us a context. So let's start reading from verse 22 of Ephesians 5, and we'll read through the end of the chapter. Paul says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband. I'd like to pray one more time. Father, we do pray that you would open your word unto us, that you'd give us understanding, and that you would help our thinking uh, as we engage with this uh, prevalent and preeminent issue of sexuality. I pray that we would come out of here more equipped to steward our own sexuality well and unto your glory. And I pray that your church would be the bright, shining lamp in this dark age that we live in. So help me now and help us to hear your word and mix it with faith, to salute it and embrace it, and we pray that it would bear much fruit for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Yo, this thing is really wigging me out, so if I'm mad stiff, I'm blaming it on this mic here. Okay, uh, last year, uh, somebody gave uh, my wife and I uh, some books, and they're these books that uh, they're designed for parents to write in. They're full of a bunch of questions that parents are to write in and to leave them for their own kids, right? So it's like, what's your first memory? All this stuff. And I haven't written in it yet, but I plan to, right? <laughs> All this, you know, intimate stuff like that you wouldn't think to tell your kids, and so I plan to leave it. Uh, if you could imagine with me, let's say that I fill that book up and I leave it to my children and my children grow up and uh, they stray from the Lord, they go into the world. Let's just say, for example, that my kids start smoking weed, okay? And, uh, but they're not just using, you know, your zigzags from the store, they're not rolling blunts. They, they're deciding, you know what? Let's roll some joints with, with, with these papers, that dad wrote in for us, right? There's no copies of this. I write it with my own hand, with my own fountain pen. 
uh, but, but they're going to use it to roll joints with. Now, you, you know that if that happened, not only would it rip my heart out, but it would be flagrant. You know what I mean? Like the sin would be aggravated. It'd be one thing to find my children involved in any, any sin, right, as they grow up. But it'd be quite another. It would be like be in my face, right? To take this thing I've given them, this, this special thing that I've given to them, and they're going to actually use it and pervert it to further sin. Well, that's exactly what we've done with sex and sexuality, right? And so we're going to just look at Paul's admonitions here to husbands, and as he stepped back and he applies it to Christ and the church. And look, I'm not going to tease all this out. We're just going to look at a couple clues along the way that can help us in our thinking as we go from here and as we engage with this culture for Christ and as we walk with Christ ourselves through these things, right? Okay, so uh, basically what I'm trying to say is the dignity of something doesn't alleviate its perversion. It makes it worse, right? We say everyone's an image bearer. When we say the image of God has not been lost in man, we're not saying sin is lesser because of that. We're saying sin is worse, because he, he bears the image of God, that means the perversion is greater, right? What's worse, to use $5,000 to, to make a bonfire with or $5 million? It's worse, the greater the value. And so with sex, is this wonderful thing God's given to us, and its perversion is that much worse because of it. But our context here in Paul is he's admonishing the church uh, what he says is his famous statement, submit to one another at the end of verse, uh, verse 21 here, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And a lot of people, that's their favorite proof text, right? That all Christians should submit to each other. Husbands and wives submit to each other, right? So if you go on from there, you see Paul does three categories here of submission. He talks about wives and husbands. He talks about children and parents. He talks about slaves and masters, employees and employers, right? And so, uh, is it true that Paul's saying everyone should submit to each other? In other words, is Paul saying that parents should submit to children? Parents, submit to your children as is fitting in the Lord. Do you think that Paul's saying that? Do you think that Paul's saying, uh, bosses, submit to your employees? Right? Paul's not saying that. When Paul says submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ, he's saying wherever your station is in life, whatever offices you carry with you, you work within those offices in an orderly manner, right? So when he says, wives, submit to your husbands, right? It's within the framework of marriage and the offices. And that's where we find ourselves. And Paul's admonishing husbands. You notice he gives wives a couple verses here, and then he gives husbands all these verses at the end of the chapter, this big paragraph here about all that husbands need to do. And it's, uh, it's terrifying if you're a husband, if you really take these verses seriously. I <clears throat> How you're supposed to love your wife in the same way that Christ has loved the church. We're going to zoom in on verses 31 and 32, and we're just going to make three observations about sexuality as it relates to the culture and as it really is as God has made it. First, we're going to see what kind of thing sexuality is. Second, we're going to look at the context, the proper context of sexuality and then third, we'll look at the content of sexuality. So, first, the kind of thing that sexuality is. Look at verse 31. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. You all know where that's quoted from. You heard it at every wedding, right? Always that verse. From Genesis chapter 2, in the creation account, right? This is pre-fall, original design, creation. Right? So the first thing we're going to say, what kind of thing is sexuality? It's a creation. It's a creature. In other words, it's not God. Right? We all know that, but it bears repeating. Sexuality is not this divine thing that we make it. It's, it's a creation. God made it. Right? So, so sexuality is not God. That's the first observation here. It's something that God made and gave. Right? Sexuality in our own culture and in our own lives so often, it becomes a God, right? Sexuality is a terrible God. It's, but it's a wonderful servant. <laughs> That's what it's designed to be. 
a servant, right? A creature, right? Designed for God's people and for God's creatures to enjoy, to lead them to Him. But as soon as we flip the thing on its head and try to put sexuality as the God of all, which really, let's be honest, like that's it, is the end all be all of all things, right? That's it, man. It's a terrible, terrible God and master. They can't see. It can't hear, it can't speak, it can't do nothing for you, it definitely cannot save you. It's a creation. And it's nothing more than that. A marvelous one, but a creation. So it's creature, right? Uh, It is a creative creation. It's a creative creation. You know, your old R. Kelly songs and all that, let's go half on a baby, right? Like Like sex creates creatures it's crazy it's something like science fiction stuff man it makes people right like that's wild you know (laughs) so like for christians yo it's like that's the reality though like yo let's make a person that's crazy you know what i'm saying like god creates the person but from the two yo this is a gift man there's a wonderful, wonderful thing. We take it for granted, we twist it, we worship it, but in its proper context, man, it sparkles with God's glory and His goodness to us, right? It's a creative creature because it makes people, right? You can't divorce sex from the creation of image bearers. You can't. Of course, that's the, the goal of the abortion industry is to sever this tie that can't be severed. It's unnatural. You know what I'm saying? Like you can't break the things apart. Abortion seeks to break it apart and say we can have this without this, but you'll never be able to to separate them. It creates people. So what it's become is, instead of the proverbial, let's go half on a baby, let's be honest. What it is is, yo, let's, if we make somebody, let's murder them. It's okay, right? Like we could just kill them. A real person, I don't care if I make one because it's more important how I feel and what I want, so let's get rid of the thing. You see how perverse this is? It's terrible. It's unspeakable. You look back at the Roman games or, or slavery or any other thing, like on the history books at the end, what will jump off the page more than anything else? Yo, they killed babies for their own pleasure. So that's what's happening right now by the millions. But, but, but sexuality is, more, is a creative creature. Isn't that tight? Uh, it's also a mature creation, a mature creature. Uh, the quote from Paul is at the very end of the creation account in Genesis. In chapter 3, he gets into the fall, right? But this is the original creation. And so, uh, you know, it's usually been said that the woman is, is the crowning jewel of creation. And we all know that's true. Praise the Lord. Right? I got my own woman right over here. Wave. My woman, right? I got my own, man. We'll get into that. That's raw. Uh, <laughs> crowning jewel, right? It's not technically correct, though. Like, the crowning jewel of creation is the union of man and woman. Adam sings the first song, right? He names all the animals, right? Goes to the zoo. That's cool, that's cool, that's cool. God brings him Eve, and he sings, finally, at last. Like, he spit the first freestyle, right? When he saw Eve. The crowning jewel of creation was the union of man and woman. And this is what he says. You know, Paul's talking about sex. Moses is talking about sex. The two shall become one flesh. He said they were naked and not ashamed. Right? This, was, this was it. So when we say that, that sex is a creation, we're saying it's no more than that. But like, let's not trip. It's right at the top. We should embrace that. I'm not going Mark Driscoll on you today on all that, all right? But what I'm saying is like, dude. (laughs) It's up there. Let's be honest, right? That's the way God made it. It is like the crowning jewel of creation. And it's grown folks' business. Sex is grown folks' business. And that leads us onto our second observation here, 
which is the, the context of, of sexual expression in sexuality. The context here that, that Paul gives by quoting Moses is what? Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two. The two shall become one flesh. The two. This is the way that God designed it to be. One man, one woman. Right? I know some of you dudes wish you was born back in Abraham's day. You do the concubine thing. But that was whack, right? This, this is the reality of it. This is higher. One man, one woman. The literal here is let, let a man leave his father and mother and hold fast to his woman. It's his woman. Like the same way that God made Eve for Adam, that was his woman. In marriage, it's like, this is mine. This is my woman, right? This is my man. And it's two. The two shall become one. This is the proper context for sexual expression. Not sexuality, I will get into that, but sexual expression is only to be made within the confines of grown folks' business. Let's do this together. Marriage. That's what it's made for. That's what it's made for. Proper context. Marriage. Right? Like, this is where romance goes and should go. Right? Like, casual dating. I'm not talking about talking talking to people as you grow up, right? I'm not even saying like hanging out together, but it's like casual dating is not a thing, man. Like, it's for the purpose of getting married. You know what I mean? I, okay, I want to get to know you. You don't got to put your cards on front like I did right away with it. You can talk to my wife and see what it was really like. I was like, not, I'm not a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But I said, look, I don't know what the Lord has for us, man. You know, that was like when I first met her. It was mad wild. Well, well look at this. We're married now. You don't got to do all that. But it's like to be purposeful and mindful because the goal is my wife, my husband, it's us, right? Like, there's no bae, okay? It's not bae. Like, okay, bae's your, your, your spouse, okay, that's cool. But it's like, no, this bae, right? It's not bae. You know, people want that. Look, even in this culture where it's like we don't, we, we denigrate marriage, people that are together, they treat it like marriage. They talk about it like marriage. They want it to be like a pretend marriage, you know what I'm saying? I don't care if they're in middle school or they're grown, they live together. It's like they treat it like marriage. There's something there to strive towards. Like even in our fallen nature, we understand, you know, that's great. So that's what it is. His wife, he says. Uh, I, I say again, like it's grown folks' business, okay? The difference between uh, rampant sexual immorality in this culture and the biblical ideal uh, of, of dedicated marriage. It's like the difference between having a taste for candy, right, or having a taste for like fine wines or coffees. I'm in Southern Baptist territory. I meant coffee. I didn't say wine. I didn't say that, right? It was coffee. All right? This is water. Yeah. I'm 1689, man. It's all good. <laughs> uh, when you were a kid, like, you could smash on some candy. You know, boxes of whatever, Skittles, anything. You, you just keep eating it. But as you grow, it's like, nah, I don't really, you know what I'm saying? Like, you lose the taste for that, right? The, the, this obsession with sexual conquest, and this is the end-all, be-all, and I'm going to sleep with as many people as I can. That's like the kid stuff, man, of liking candy where you don't have a developed palate where you can actually appreciate somebody for life, like a fine-aged coffee, right? You know what I mean? (laughs) Okay? Look, I always say boredom is in the eye of the beholder. In other words, like, bore, boring people get bored. There's too much to do and too much to see. I don't care if you're sitting outside looking at the clouds. You should never be bored, man. You know what I mean? Like, boring people become easily bored. And this is the biblical ideal for marriages. I'm not being bored with my spouse now. Like, I'm not bored with you. I'm more intrigued than ever with you. 
I want to know you more. You know what I mean? It's grown folks' business. You guys understand me. It's a big difference. And the church needs to stand on its feet. I'm talking you go out and talk about this like it's crazy, but live it. Be it. Right? The biblical ideal for sexual expression between a man and a woman, right? It's growing together sexually. Growing together. In other words, the, 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 the sexual expression within a marriage should be progressive, should be growing. I know you go through seasons, all that, right? I'm not going to get into all that. But there should be a trajectory of growth in intimacy together. That should be happening. I'll go ahead and say it. Christians should have banging sex lives. You just should. We'll get into all that. But like sex was created for Christians. Paul said marriage and food were created for those who believe and know the truth. And I was like, we're not saying that unbelievers shouldn't be married or that they shouldn't eat. But what we're saying is like they don't really get it all. There's more here. Like if you know God in Christ and you know the truth, then you can really understand what this is. Like it was made for you. So there should be an excellence there and a growth. As far as, uh, you know, Scripture speaks in a wild way. A couple years ago, there was like some super holy cats, right? <laughs> There's always some super holy cats. Uh, and they were saying, there was this whole movement about like, yo, you shouldn't lust after your wife. You guys might be familiar with that. Don't lust after your wife, and I'm not going to lust after my wife. I'm thinking like, that's madness, yo. Like, <laughs> what are you saying? Like, don't, you shouldn't desire your wife? Like, what are you saying? Right? So as I thought about it, I'm reading scripture. In Proverbs chapter 5, Solomon says this, in verses 19 and 20. Now listen, he says, uh, you know, let your wife... Let her satisfy you, right? Uh, be always intoxicated with her love. Okay. And then the next verse he says, For why should you be intoxicated with uh, an adulteress? Now what's interesting about the, those verses is it's the exact same word, exact same uh, tense, everything. It's identical. In other words, like what happens between a man and his wife like the feeling that the husband gets there, it's like the same. You know what I mean? As a man would get with an adulteress, with a prostitute in sexual immorality. Be intoxicated with your wife? That needs to happen. So don't get super holy on them, right? Like, maybe that's what Solomon, don't be overly righteous, all right? Marriage. It's this mature, lifelong, awesome thing, man awesome thing. Now, if you're single, if you're single, there's a couple things that could be going on, right? Uh, Scripture's pretty clear that there's a gifting for singleness in general, right? Like in general, Jesus said, to those whom it has been given, you know what I mean? That's okay. They can accept that statement that it's better not to be married. But Paul goes so far as to say, like, dude, like, for the sake of, of sexual purity so that you do not burn, you should be married, in other words, if you're single and you have a desire to be married, in the general course of things, like you should expect that. You might not see how it's ever going to happen, but that's not what God's asking you to do. He's asking you to steward your sexuality, trusting Him to provide that in His perfect time. To steward it, okay? So being single is not like being asexual or unsexual, right? You're sexual. And you steward it, though. You see? It's still a form of sexual expression. If you're going to steward this thing unto God's glory, waiting for his perfect time, and you're going to save yourself that way. All right? Now, y'all probably watch all the Netflix programs. I'm going to do the Clint thing. If you haven't seen it, don't watch it. All right? I'm not going to recommend anything, but if you've seen Defenders uh, with Iron Fist in them, you know Stick is the leader of the hand's greatest enemy, and you know what that organization's called? The Chaste. You guys know this? They're called the Chaste. And you watch Defenders, and you know what you think? Yo, that's raw. Like, they're called the Chaste, man. That's tight, right? How come, like, that's tight, but if we're talking about, like, actually being the Chaste, man, is, is, is whack. That's raw. To be the Chaste? To be those 
who steward themselves for their Creator and for the good gifts He's had for them, those who are victorious over sexual sin. I'm not talking about perfection. I'm talking about the chaste. That's raw. And if you are single, you steward your sexuality. You draw close to Christ, and you pray for your spouse, your future spouse. And if God decides to leave you single, He will provide everything you need. You don't got to trip. He will provide what you need. So prepare, trust, wait, uh, uh, but steward the thing. You know, people's famous verse, their favorite verse for, you know, not smoking. Again, I'm just, okay, it's SBC, all right? Don't do anything harmful to your body, right? Their favorite verse is your body is a temple for the Holy Spirit. If you read those verses in context, you know what Paul says, Uh, sexual immorality is the only sin against the body. He's talking about sexual immorality if he's talking about anything. There is something uniquely devastating about sexual sin. And maybe some of you guys are are in bondage to it. All right? And you know that it, it, it floors you. It saps your strength. It ruins your conscience. It takes everything out of you, man. There is hope right? There is grace. Uh, But let's not trip. Like, it's up there. Sexual sin is devastating. Absolutely devastating. So may the Lord help us to steward it well, right? So the context, the context of sexuality is expressed if you're single as stewarding it as the chaste, like the real chaste, man, right? The chaste unto God and unto your future spouse, if the Lord wills. If you're married, yo, you steward that thing. You grow in that thing. You put effort into it. You seek to please one another in it. That's real. Okay, that's the context of sexuality, right? Third, the content of sexuality. Now, I'm not talking about like the actual content. That's what you guys thought I was going to get into, all right? I'm not talking about all that, even though the Bible has some stuff to say about that. It does, but we're not going to get into that. By the content of sexuality, what I mean is, is the meaning that sexuality has been vested with by God. So let's look back at what Paul's saying there. So, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, hold fast to his wife, right? Like, they're dedicated, they're growing together, they're beholden to each other, all right? The two shall become one flesh. And then Paul gets, like, really wild here in verse 32. This mystery is profound, And I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. This mystery here is is the truth that's encapsulated here in Genesis. The whole thing, right? So so what you see here is the whole courting process into marriage, right? A man is going to leave his household and he's going to hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. Their marriage is consummated in sexual union. That's what it is, right? Uh, that whole process, by the way, is there, is there any like maybe book of the Bible that's like dedicated to exploring that whole process of a man leaving his father and mother and eventually holding fast to his wife? If only there was like a whole book dedicated to that whole thing, right? Uh, oh, Song of Solomon, praise the Lord. Okay, so there's a book dedicated to that whole thing and Paul says that whole thing refers to Christ and the church, man. I don't know how you get around it. That whole process refers to Christ and the church. And so this divinely inspired uh, exploration, celebration of that refers to Christ and the church, man. Right? Okay. Refers to Christ and the church. Now, when we say the content of sexual expression, sexuality, is Christ and the church, right? Right? I'm not saying that, 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 that marriage and sex is a sacrament. That's what the Roman Catholic Church believes. The reason they believe that is because the Latin Vulgate translation of this says uh, this sacrament is great. The sacrament is great and refers to Christ and the church. So it's not a sacrament, okay? If, if it was a sacrament, you guys would never miss your devos again, right? Uh, <laughs> but it ain't a sacrament. <laughs> All right? Like, <laughs> it's not a means of grace, okay? But <laughs> okay? Uh, 
but it is, it is sacramental in the sense that all creation is sacramental. It participates in God. It mirrors and reflects God. And it's not just when you sit here under the Word or with your Bible in prayer that you draw close to God. You draw close to God and can draw close to Him in all of life. No matter what you're doing, you can walk with Him. And that would include this, of course. So it's like sacramental in the sense that it's been vested with unique meaning. That it's been designed to reflect Christ and the church. Now let's look at the way Paul says this. Uh, this mystery is profound or great, right? This mystery, this truth that has been vested in the reality he's talking about of the design of man and woman. The whole design of the thing was created after a blueprint of Christ and the church, right? This is, of course, why Christ is greater than sexuality because sexuality was created to mirror Christ, not the other way around. It was made in His image. It was designed after the heavenly reality of it. Uh, so, but Paul says this statement, so this mystery is profound, it's great. There's a truth here that's been vested in this mysterious, wonderful thing. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. Now, Paul's emphatic here. He's drawing attention to himself. I. I. Me. I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. What does it mean? Is Paul adding new meaning to Genesis 2.24? When he says, you know, Moses just meant this, but, but, but I, I'm saying in my own. Is Paul giving a private interpretation of Genesis 2.24 here? Certainly not. I mean, he's a public apostle. He's writing scripture here, right? The way that the ancient saint Chrysostom studied this, what Paul's saying here is that it, that it was something great and wonderful that the blessed Moses, or rather God himself, intimated in these words. In other words, whether, whether it was Moses who actually knew everything he was speaking here, or God who definitely did, the reality is there's an arrow vested in Genesis 2.24, and the reality it points to is Christ in the church. And God put that arrow there. And so the, the content of sexuality is really about Christ and the church. It points beyond itself. This means that there's a tremendous, tremendous honor in stewarding this gift that the world and that you, before you came to Christ, certainly, and maybe you struggle with it now as a Christian, have been defiling the temple of your body by taking this tremendous honor and dragging it through the dirt for your own pleasure. We struggle with that, don't we? We need grace, beloved, because the honor is unspeakable that he would give us this treasure that mirrors uh, the eternal relationship between God and his people is marvelous. It's a picture of the gospel, is what it is. The whole process of a man leaving his father and mother, going to get his wife, winning her, uniting with her, uh, being with her, that she is where he is, right? That, that, that pictures Christ coming down to get his bride. He won us. We're his, and he told him, I'm coming back so that you can be where I am. That's marriage language. So that we can be together, right? You're married with your wife and your husband. It's like, yo, we're together all the time. We live together. That, that whole picture is about eternity and what that will be like. So sexuality, sexual expression, pictures the gospel. So here's another one for you. Preach the gospel at all times if necessary. There you go. <laughs> Not everyone's picking up what I'm laying down, right? It's okay. Uh, but the bottom line here is Paul is giving a divine commentary on Genesis 2.24. And when, when, when one scripture says what another scripture really means, then you can be sure that scripture says what scripture says it says. Yeah. This is about Christ and the church, man. And what that does for us is this. This, this thing is lofty. This, this, this thing is, is, is magnificent, it's precious, and it is to be treated in holiness. It's not a game. And I'm not just talking about you 
falling into pornography, sexual immorality. I'm talking your thought life, your looking life. All of that is the stewardship of this tremendous gift that is for believers. Now, what the culture has done with this, what we do with, with this by nature, is we take this tremendous gift, right? It's like the, the, in creation, it's like the closest thing in the physical creation to picturing the gospel. And what do we do? It's the very thing we focus on perverting. What culture's done with sexuality is it's really set up the, the abomination of desolation in the holy place, man. It's high-handed. The culture is utterly corrupt. The culture of this world, man. And we need grace to walk in the midst of this world in uprightness and steward the thing. It's open shame. Sexuality expresses a certain shame. Sexual immorality. There's a shame involved. And there should be a shame involved. Right? It's, it's a shameless act of self-defilement when we sin sexually that is high-handed and it's like we're slaughtering the pig right in the, right in the temple, man. Right in God's face. You know? That's what we do. This is why Romans 1, so like Paul's saying, okay, if the crowning jewel of creation was the man and the woman, the crowning jewel of the fall is sexual perversion. And that's what Paul does in Romans 1. It, it's the touchstone. It, it shows how perverse things are. It's the capstone on the temple de devoted to sin. So sex is not a toy. It's not a game. It's not a joke. It's big. It's, it's, it's mighty. It's, it's high. And I'm going to go ahead and say it's holy. It's holy in the sense that we must steward it rightly because it means more than just us and our little lives and our own satisfaction. It has something to say about Christ and the church. Let me end by saying a few things, okay? I'm trying to strike a balance here, all right? Uh, there are better things than sex. There are. They joke about that. They name the better than sex cake. I never had it. I don't like cake. Whatever, okay? <laughs> I don't care. There are better things than sex. In this world, and you better believe it in the world to come, I'm not talking about in, like an orgasmic eternity. That's what I'm talking about, man. But an ecstatic, higher order of pleasure. Higher order of physical delight and pleasure in eternity, man. That nothing in this world can touch. There's better things. And if we knew what those better things really were, we would be inspired. To, we'd be better people. There's better things than sex. There's worse things than sex. There's worse things. There, there's almost unique judgment attached to sexual immorality. Fornicators and adulterers, Hebrews 13 says, what? God will judge. God will judge. Almost as this unique, I'm going to deal with y'all for this. I will judge this sin. Because it's not a toy. It's not a game. There's worse things. There's hellfire. There's eternal judgment. There's eternal damnation. There's being rejected by God, rejected by the one who created you, wove you together, not just your body, your person, being rejected by him forever. That's worse. And no earthly pleasure is worth that. So there's worse things, right? Uh, at the end of the day, sex, it's a thing. It's a thing. But Christ, he's God. Christ is God. And he's greater than this thing that he created. And I, I, I got to say one more thing. Back to the beginning of the story. Let's, let's imagine my children did that. Took the book that I poured my heart and soul into for them with my, in my own hand and used it to sin with. Would that be the end of them? Do you think that I would disown them forever? Would I not rather say, look, I don't even care about it, man. Just come home. Just come home. You understand that like, this is not like the unpardonable sin. It's not. There is hope of mercy and grace and cleansing for any of us because of the reality that it points to that Christ bore the wrath of God in our place, right? I've tried to lay out a couple hints from the text 
that can help us think and maybe steward this thing just a little bit better. So let's pray. Father, we pray that you would exalt Jesus Christ in his supremacy, that he is more satisfying, he is more lovely, he is, is better and greater than any created thing. So help us to walk with you and in all things to rest in the finished work of Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.